Well, the man that was known as Deadly, Derek Underwood, has passed away at the age of uh, 78. An extraordinary performer over 25 years for Kent, 900 matches, 297 test wickets for England uh, and over 2,500 uh, first-class wickets. Uh, a, a, an extraordinary career in many ways. A pioneer as well, Harmi. I mean, not a conventional left-arm spinner by any means. He bowled much quicker than even any spinners of today's age. Um, but my goodness me, a little <laughs> uncovered pitches. Poor cheapers. Um, you know, he didn't need much help from the pitch, but if there was any around, he really was deadly. Yeah, he was. He was He was well nicknamed. And it's sad, very sad, you know, to lose a, another great of our of our game. And he was a great. You know, England's leading wicket taker from a spin bowler's point of view on them uncovered pitches. Um, I spent my informative years of cricket career with you know, the great man and I've spoke to him, spoke about him a lot on this show in such high regard, Norman Gifford. Norman Gifford, a spin bowler himself, you know, who bowled it that little bit quicker, got over 2,000 first-class wickets. And you know, when, whenever Giff spoke about times gone by and he spoke so fondly about how good Derek Underwood was, um, and you see some of the footage you know, of the Ashes when... You know, sawdust everywhere, men round the bats, and <laughs> Eric Underwood, he was more of a, you know, a little medium pacer, and that just little bowl, little cutters than, than your conventional slow bowler. But, you know, if there was anything in the surface, he was he was virtually unplayable. Um, and it is a sad loss to cricket, sad loss to Kent. Um, you know, he's a, he was a wonderful man. Met him on a couple of occasions. Um, once at Lords, I think, um, during a during a test the test match. Um, he was a really gentle, softly spoken um, man who who obviously had a, a huge love for the game because the longevity of his career was just, it was mind-boggling. 25 years in the game, you know, over two and a half thousand wickets. It is a sad day for English cricket. I always found it ironic that uh, he was nicknamed Deadly because uh, really, as you say, off the field, I mean, you know, you... You, you, you'd. I mean, he would take sort of six for fifty, and you'd feel like you'd been savaged by a sheep. And he was the gentlest, kindest, most, most wonderfully considerate man, and yet he was deadly on the cricket field. So, anyway, let's let's hear from a man who did know him a lot better than than both of us. Um, former England coach, legendary commentator uh, for Talk Sport as well, David Bumble Lloyd. Um, who were joined Paul Hawksby and Perry Groves over on TalkSport to pay his tribute to Derek Underwood. Had you kept in touch with him, Bumble? I saw him from time to time during cricket seasons and uh, you know, I played with him, as, as, as you mentioned, obviously played against him. He, he was just a superb bloke, very down-to-earth. Um, he, he, as a batsman, he, he was quite funny. Uh, but his main forte, of course, was as a spin bowler, a devastating spin bowler. But he had these sort of 10 to 2 feet and he'd come out as a night watchman and get peppered by fast bowlers. And and he was frightened to death. But somehow from time to time, he, he survived. Um, a wonderful fella, absolute gent of a bloke. And he loved a pint. Oh. He just <laughs> loved a pint at the end of play. And he was quite posh as well. And, you know, we, we all have, in the game, we'd have great memories of him. Bumble, uh, not, I, I can remember, I grew up, like, around Essex in the days of um, Ray East and David Ackfield, obviously, mm. like, the Essex spin <laughs> twins. And with uh, Derek Underwood, I obviously just saw him on, on TV. Mm. And he was a bit of a trailblazer. You know, like, what I related to is when Boris Becker, you first saw him at Wimbledon, yeah. and he was diving and diving volleys. You know, yeah. no one ever seen that before. Mm. With uh, Derek Underwood, the spin bowling was more spin sort of medium pace yeah. where on wet tracks he could skid it through and then when it dried out a bit, then he could turn it. Yeah, he, he was a cutter. He, he didn't have, you know, when spin bowlers will, will put purchase on their index finger, not him. He held it so differently. And everybody, when he first started, he, he wanted to be a medium pacer. And he quickly changed into the style of spin bowling. And you mentioned his nickname, Deadly. He was exactly that. 
on a pitch, uncovered pitches as they had, he would bowl a team out in an hour. He'd be absolutely unplayable. Um, it, you know, I remember a game we played, I think it was at Blackpool, and it was a green tinge pitch with a bit of dampness in it, and the seamers had done the bit, and it might have been Mike Dennis who threw him the ball. Come on, Deadly, have a ball. Nothing untoward. We didn't think this is going to be unplayable. He got seven for six. Wow, he just bowled us out. And unplayable because it, it, he wasn't a spinner. He was a cutter and he bowled it much quicker than spin bowlers do. It's legendary in England uh, commentator David Bumble Lloyd paying tribute to Derek Underwood. Uh, after his uh, passing at the age of 78. Um, now then, following on County Cricketer, our sister podcast uh, gives you a full and in-depth review, and you're on it, Harmy, of the County Championship. So we're just going to uh, pick out a few highlights uh, for for us um, because we've got so much else to fit in on the show. Just to say again, following on County Cricketer comes out every Thursday. Harmy's on it with uh, the four-man panel, and you'll get all the reaction and uh, discussion and analysis on the county championship round two. But um, a couple of stories that have come to, to mind, uh, come to uh, our attention, Harmy, that we want to talk about. Um, well, you know how I love bowlers scoring runs. I love it most um, when they score them at, at nine, ten, and eleven. But very, very close second is when a night watchman does uh, does something special. And Matt Potts, well, I mean, we've got to talk about the Kookaburra ball and, and the, the size of the scores. Warwickshire scoring 698 for three. 698 for three in 134 overs, by the way. Um, and Durham, that how about scoring 517 and following on? <laughs> it's just... Just crazy. But M Manny Potts has gone out as night watchman in the follow-on innings and scored 100. That's just a tremendous story. It is. It's a brilliant story. 149 off 254 balls as Matt Potts got as the game petered out into a draw. What I want to know is who, who on earth wanted a night watchman at that point on that wicket when there was over 1,000 runs scored? And they've missed out on potentially getting 150 themselves. So good on you, Potsy, for allowing me you. It's always nice to see a bowler score and runs. The Cougar Bowl will always be a debate. It will be a massive debate, whether it's right or it's wrong. You know, once it gets wet, it's it's pretty much it's pretty much game over for the bowlers once that happens. It looked as though they were playing on one side of the square at Edge Baston. Um, but you know, it, it is, you know, you you've said it many, many times. You know, you've still got to score them runs. Um, and Potsy did when he knows Night Watchman, and he, he got 149. It's a great story, fantastic story. I think he's you come away, I'm sure you'll come away from away from Edge Baston with mixed memories. You know, on his way to Edge Baston, he's thinking, I'm going to come away with having a great day with a ball and not a very good day with a bat. And unfortunately, it was the other way around. A couple of other stories, uh, Harmy, that um, do you remember? I think it was. Three weeks ago, we were talking about expensive bowling analyses, and I asked you uh, whether you'd ever come close to going for 200, um, and you said no, fortunately not, um, thankfully not. But um, poor old Callum Parkinson, um, two for 206 uh, a couple of days ago. And, um, I mean, the, the scores have just been monstrous, haven't they? Uh, you know, Essex 530 for seven. Um putting Kent uh, under the cosh, Lancashire 484. Um, there's the Middlesex North Ants game, 550 each. Uh, so so why is it that Australian bowlers can take wickets on flat wickets in Australia with the Kookaburra ball? Why, why is that? The only thing I can think of is that the Kookaburra ball is now, because it's played in the time of the year, once the Kookaburra ball gets wet, then it, it, it stops functioning. Uh, and a, a lot of the Australia, South Africa, you know, the, the bowlers, when they use it on flat, flat pitches, they get it in times when it's it's bone dry, it's rock hard. The ball then becomes a reverse swinging ball after 35 overs. And then you see your know, skill sets of bowlers. It ain't reverse swinging in April and, April and May in England. So <laughs> once that ball gets wet after... Five overs, six overs, it's gone into the outfield or it's gone 
past the wiki keeper and it's gone into the, the covers that's got a whole load of water on, then you've, you're you basically waiting 80 overs to get it changed. So that's the only thing I can think of. I've not spoke to many bowlers. I've not spoke to any of the Durham lads who really had a struggle this week. You know, we've built them up. You know, the bowling unit, Cars Bowling, Rain Potts, that looked a phenomenal bowling unit going to, to Edgebaston and it's conceded nearly 700 runs. So it's interesting that the, the, the traditional seamers, English seamers, the likes of, you know, Rushworth, you know, Hannon Dolby, one or two others, they, they've not, they've not featured in the uh, in the many in wicket taking columns. So all I can think of is this cookable ball. But I don't mind it, you know, man. As, as much as I am a, a, a bowler that wants to see loads and loads of wickets taken, I like a contest between bat and ball. But every now and again, uh, uh, seeing bowlers have to think about it and struggle about it. There's been a lot of spin bowled over the course of this last two weeks. So, um, you know, let's 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 see what and you know, the, the the actual participants say over the course of this next two weeks once that Cookaba trial is over. But it certainly made a difference at the start of the season. Um, and there's been plenty of plenty of runs scored. Okay, and you know that I'm slightly obsessed about uh, how some players get recognition and talked about as international cricketers potentially. And some others, for some reason, just don't. Um, So Matt Critchley has uh, moved to Essex. Now, 151 not out and five for 105. Uh, You know, fantastic performances. And I I think we should try and get him on the show because I'm like Sam Cooke last week. You know, Sam Cooke's not been talked about as England England candidate. And yet in the first round of uh, Kookaburra Championship games, there he takes 10 for and wins the game against Knotts, bowls them out for 80. And Matt Critchley is just doing it game after game. I know we're in this, but in the second game of the season, but last year he, he was he was doing it. You know, he's moved to Essex, bigger club, and he's still doing it, and he still doesn't get mentioned as a potential England player. No, no he doesn't, which um, I'm not sure why, because his numbers, a bit like Ryan Higgins, you know, you, you could mm. possibly see why Ryan Higgins doesn't get mentioned at playing for England because from a bowling point of view, is he going to be quick enough, effective enough? And is his batting good enough to play as a frontline batter and bowling help? So, you know, some, sometimes some players are very, very good at both, but no, not good enough at, at one skill set to excel, to get them in the team, to then have the other back them up as a classed as, a, as, a, as an all-rounder. Um, I'm not seeing enough of Critchley to form my own opinion of why he's not talked about in international recognition but the likes of Higgins who's now gone back to Middlesex uh, Critchley who's now at Essex um, they put numbers on the board very consistently for their sides and uh, I'm sure people are looking at them but whether there is that 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 underlying an issue whether you know if you know, maybe a flaw in their technique where you see a bowler or a batter at the, at the highest level, possibly not being able to hold down a, a number six, one to six spot, or you know, be one of the frontline three seamers. Then, unfortunately, they're unbelievable first-class cricketers, but never really get international recognition. You know, great for Essex. I'm sure Anthony McGrath's going. I don't want you to play for England because we want you to <laughs> win the championship for us. But you know, good on him. He just keeps going. He's been a great performer the last couple of years. He had a couple of big bat. He had a big bash, and he's been franchises. Um, he's gone about his job very, very nicely, and and long may that continue. Okay, my final comment is Keaton Jennings, averaging sixty six in the last three years in the county championship, scored one hundred and seventy two in Lancashire's four hundred and eighty four first innings. I I just remember, you know, like late eighties throughout the nineties, if there was a player. An opening batsman averaging 66 um, for three years, then, uh, you, you know, he, he wouldn't be able to fight his way out of the England team, uh, let mm. alone uh, contemplate <laughs> the possibility of trying to get back into it. Um, so so there's him. Um, but I'm going to give the final word to George Bell, uh, to you, Harmy, uh, who um, mm. suffered uh, one of the more miserable <laughs> batting fates um, for length. Yeah, he did. I, I watched that again, and I was, I was, I got myself annoyed. I, I love George Bell. I never met the kid. Never met the kid. Watched him play a few times. I just think he's, he's, he, he just looks a lovely lo- young man who plays some beautiful shots. Twenty-one year old looks. He's looks. Tw- he's twenty-one year old going on twelve. Um, he, he just, I, I, 
he just seems as though he's a he's a smashing talent, a cricketer. And then yeah, ninety nine nicks one into you know third slip area, gets run out unfortunately, and I'm not sure who it was, so I can't really be sure of the name of the person here. But he gets a send off of somebody who I, I mean that's just nonsense. I'm not a big fan of send offs anywhere, but whoever gave young George Bell a send off once once a good hard look in the mirror. You know the kid's 90, 99. Yeah, he's been run out. Yes, there's you get carried away every now and again, but I'm I'm sorry. You know, sending somebody off for getting 99 run out. Yeah, you you do have to have a look at yourself because yeah, I, that's not what the cricket that for me is not what cricket's about. So yeah, you know, I hope whoever that is looks at it again and thinks mm, I'm a bit silly there, but I'm sure he might be. It was an absolutely fascinating and intriguing round of uh, championship matches once again. And uh, following on County Cricketer, uh, you'll be on that uh, on Thursday, Harmy. So uh, you'll go into a great deal more depth uh, on all the stories. And, and as always, there are loads and loads of fascinating ones. Uh, you're listening to Following On here on Talk Sport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And next up, we'll continue to look back at the week's County Championship action. And uh, we'll be joined by Nottinghamshire batter Joe Clark to discuss his tremendous start to the campaign with back-to-back -back hundreds. But now then, as promised at the top of the show, we're joined by Joe Clark, who's begun the season with a real bang for Nottinghamshire back-to-back -back hundreds. Um, Joe, congratulations. I, I, a lot of people are talking about the Kookaburra ball and the very, very high scores, which I think is um, a, a sort of a, a backhander to the slap of the face, isn't it? Um, I, you, you still got to you still got to score the runs, and you've been scoring them very, very well indeed. Uh, yes, yeah, indeed. But I mean, there's obviously been a lot of big scores um, across the games this round and the first round. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, the first game here at Trent Bridge had a result, um, and if the rain hadn't have intervened today, I'm sure there might have been another one. So, the two that we've been involved with have. Um, have produced good games cricket. Yeah, and how's that? How's that start? You know, you've 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 getting a you know, you've got a defeat and a and a, um, and a draw first up. You know, transition side, you've got a couple of new faces. How's everything started with knots? Perfect for you. I know you've been keeping wicket. You've getting a back to back hundreds, but how's things started with knots in them first two games? Uh, yeah, I think it's um, probably a realization again of of Division One cricket. We've We've been, the, especially the first game with Essex, we at one stage sort of had them 120 for five. Um, and then that sort of killer instinct, I guess, of staying on them then. And we just let them slip to, to get to a sort of 300 lead. And then, you know, got done by some brilliant ball and by Cook and Porter, which obviously they can do. And the same again here, really, when sort of had a, a 120 for one last night and uh, I think everything's going well. And then all of a sudden you find yourselves losing seven wickets in a session and um, the game sort of balancing out. So, um, yeah, obviously some new faces, some young lads with loads of potential. Um, and, yeah, I guess we sort of would have liked to have started a little bit better, but um, got some points on the board this week and we uh, move on to Somerset uh, on Friday. Joe, I'm going to circle back to uh, Ben Duckett and his development um, and your own England ambitions. But before I forget, I want to ask you about your winter um, because you, you've been really very busy and people sort of concerned about players playing 12 months of the year and burnout and that kind of thing. But you you appear to be, um, well, but judging by your scores, fresh as the daisy. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say that. But um, oh, I think it's, it's a difficult one, really. I think... Obviously, I think everyone everyone knows the the gains you can have from spending time in the winter months playing franchise cricket, and it's helped my my white ball game loads. And for the sort of last four years, that's that's my been my winters. Um, the last two years, I've decided not to do as many competitions, and for that reason, being that you know getting back in the middle of March and then going into the, the county season, I found I found difficult, and I felt like it. It hampered my my red ball game and my red ball batting, and I didn't want to didn't want to lose that. Um, you know, I still I still have ambitions to play Test cricket. I still feel like that's the pinnacle. Um, so yeah, for the last two years, I've um, got back in sort of early Feb and spent some time in the indoor school, and then got out to Abu Dhabi this winter for pre season. I felt like that's helped my red ball going massively. 
And you've, you know, last year you had Stuart Broad. This year you've got Ben Duckett coming back from from England duty. It's always nice in the dressing room when an England player comes in and raises the standards. How's that been for sort of for Ben for the rest of you lads and for the aspirations of the younger lads wanting to play for England? Seeing somebody across the room in the dressing room who had a very good winter with England, um, does that drive you? You is on to, to aspire to want to sort of you know get close to Ben in an in international as well. Definitely. I mean, yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of the lads who've played with Ben since, well, I joined at the same time, uh, Ben did not. So, you know, obviously he had a taste of it before, um, before he joined Knots, but, you know, a lot of the lads here saw his development through um, his years with Knots and the hunger he had to get back involved with England and, and how quickly it happened for him. And um, I think that's sort of shown a few of the lads in the dressing room that, you know, a, a good few months of the summer and some consistent performances, then, um, you know, you're never too far away of, of putting your name in the hat again. So, um, yeah, brilliant to see Ben obviously representing England again. And he's obviously started fantastically um, and obviously had an amazing winter. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, always, a, always a privilege to have lads um, at the club representing England. Joe, a lot of talk about the scheduling and the um, arrangement of the summer with the championship, so many games being played so early in the summer. you have any particular thoughts on that? And how many sweaters have you been wearing? <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, I guess the schedule's one of them. I think um, it gets talked about in the dressing room. Um, for me, I just I feel like you want to have the best players on the park as much as you can and... Um, you know, playing eight championship games in or seven championship games in eight weeks. Um, you know, are you going to get the best bowlers bowling the the quickest they can bowl um, in those in those seven games with sort of limited rest? So, um, I guess that's one thing I'd put out there. But um, yeah, I guess and also it's the only thing about starting this earlier potentially is is the weather, and that's affected a lot of the games around the country at the moment. And and Joe, you you're sort of batting, you know. For the people that are listening at home, they'll know the name and seen the the scores and stuff like that. But you know, do you feel as though you want you you've you've said you want to play at a higher level and play for England? This basketball team plays in a certain way. You know, you play a lot of franchise cricket. Um, do you feel as though you, this is probably the, the the peak of your time to potentially knock on that England door, especially the way England play and it, it suits a style that you uh, obviously that comes natural to you. Yeah, I think it's a difficult one, one to be fair, because you know, um, although I've haven't played on a, on a in Test match cricket, and but obviously speaking to lads who have, say you know the wickets are a lot better than they are in in county cricket. So that aggressive um, style of play may be slightly easier, but mm. sort of I fell fell into it last year of trying to play more aggressively in in the longer format and with the ball moving around and sort of April and May, I found it tough to actually play that way. So I kind of went back to what I'd been doing for three years before that and just trying to play a normal game of, you know, actually give myself a chance um, and getting myself in. But um, I think it's exciting. I think, yeah, obviously um, T20 cricket, um, obviously open the baton and, and try and play that explosive game. So I feel like I could, I could do that. Um, but it's, I also find it quite difficult doing it in county cricket. I think it's uh, uh, a bit more difficult. And finally, Joe, a lot of talk about the obvious title contenders. Surrey, big favourites, I think, in many people's eyes to defend their title. And, you know, the Essex, I think, are, are on many people's lips. Uh, Hampshire. Um, do you feel like uh, Nottinghamshire are flying under the radar this season? Maybe just uh, happy to to stay up comfortably or do you think you can mount a uh, a, a blindside challenge? Oh, I think it's it's early doors. Obviously, we'd have liked to have had a better start. Um, you know, we've got Will Young, the New Zealand batter coming in now um, and we missed Dane Patterson this week with a slight little niggle. So, um, full strength, I think we have the capabilities of beating any side, but obviously we know that the Division 1 this year is very strong. Um, you know, we've seen this week with Worcester, I feel like they can compete with any team. Durham, with the signings that they've made and the, and the strength they have there, they're definitely there to compete as well. So, definitely feels like a strong division. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll, uh, we'll see if anyone can knock Surrey off the top. 
That was Nottinghamshire batter Joe Clark reflecting on a really promising start to the season, back-to-back hundreds. And just before we hear from Sir Andrew Strauss, Harmy, um, do you think that there's more to Joe Clark's decision or request to keep wicket than uh, than than the job needed doing at Notts? Do you think? Uh, <laughs> do you think he thinks so. that might be a way into the England team? I really hope so. I really hope so because I like that about you know players, characters that. The Challenge challenge themselves have always said that if anybody wants to bat in the top sort of three or four for for England, half half the bat in the top, you know, top three for their county, really put themselves under pressure. Um, and there's a spot up for grabs, and possibly Joe saying that he's 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 worked out from the last previous two winters to come back in February, got himself ready to play red ball cricket. And I just wonder, watching in the winter, is there a spot up for grabs in the England cricket team as batter wicketkeeper? And he's gone and getting back to back hundreds while I keep wicket for knots. I hope so, because that for me tells me that there's a character there thinking about how can I get in the England team, not just, you know, trying to stay relevant as a as a as a county cricketer. So, you know, needs most possibly, but you know, good on him if he has done that, because back to back hundreds. I'm sure Rob Key and, and many more others will be watching him because he's, he is a very, very talented young man. Yeah, and he played uh, for the Lions, of course, when he was just 21. So um, he's still young. He's still got time on his side. That was Joe Clark. Now um, let's hear from former England captain Sir Andrew Strauss, who was speaking a little earlier this week with Talk Sports' Scott Taylor, who's also our producer, ahead of the inaugural Alfred Dunhill Paddle Classic at the Hurlingham Club on the 15th and 16th of May. A lot of talk about the growth of paddle, obviously, and, and then growing cricket as a whole, and there's a lot of talk about private investment in the 100, for example. Where do you where do you see that moving forward? Because ultimately, there's there's critics about the 100. It's here to stay, whatever people say. But ultimately, it's about getting cricket popular in England. And if that means outside investment to maintain the health of the game, then, then so be it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why this is even a conversation point. Yeah. I don't know why so many people have a, a sort of animosity to the 100. I mean, the 100 has the opportunity to underpin the whole of the rest of the game in this country. Um, and it, as you say, also a huge opportunity to engage a whole new audience in mm. cricket. So mm. that's what it was designed to do. That's what it's doing. Mm. And I think the right sort of private investment can really accelerate that as well. And by the way, pay for a lot of counties that are really struggling financially. So it, it, this shouldn't be a conversation point. It's just how we do it most effectively and how we focus on growing the 100 to be the, I, I feel it can easily be the second best short form tournament in the world behind the IPL. Uh, that for me should be the focus right now. And how, how much sort of sympathy do you have having been in the role of having to fit four formats in a, in a five month block in the summer and I guess how much relieved are you not to be worrying about that anymore and focus on something else? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the schedule's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem easy to get any sort of consensus on how best to do it. But if you take, it is given that, that there's going to be a block in the, the summer for the 100 and, and for all the reasons that I've articulated uh, previously, I, I still think there are things we can do in terms of the amount of red ball cricket we play and when we play our red ball cricket that we can improve the schedule will make it easier for players um, but you know ultimately they're going to be asked to play a lot of cricket as they are all year round um, and by the way you know if if we don't do it in this country they'll be doing it somewhere else in yeah. another country yeah. as well so um, always challenges and um, that schedule being the sort of the biggest Rubik's Cube of all time and one that I'm very keen not to be engaged with right at the moment I've tried my best on that one and someone else's turn. That was former England captain Sir Andrew Strauss speaking with Talk Sports Scott Taylor ahead of the uh, inaugural Alfred Dunhill Paddle Classic. Well then, Harmy, who'd have thought private investment in the hundred? Is this not something that we predicted and uh, talked about two years ago? Yeah, we said that two years ago that it was coming and needed, and all we need now, man, is it to turn into a twenty twenty <laughs> over competition, and our crystal balls would have been absolutely spot on and perfect. Who'd have thought that? Anybody would listen to us, but no, it, it's inevitable. But it's right; it's going in the right direction. Yes, we've 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 bagged it on this show, and I think rightly so. But I think the product is getting better. So let's see where it goes. So Andrew Strauss speaks brilliantly. I thought it was a great interview. He's a good man. His heart's in the right place. He wants England to do well. His high performance review he did 
that everybody in county cricket's having a go at. Um, in five years' time, ten years' time, every single thing that he put forward will be in place, guaranteed. Um, he possibly just, it was possibly done at the wrong time, but I know for a fact it was done from a good heart. And I know for a fact it was done to make English cricket better. And what the next stage of English cricket being better? Somebody coming in with a huge pot of money to develop the, the 100 into a competition that we we can shout from the rooftops. And I think it's coming very, very soon. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I can just see it in a few years' time. Somebody's going to take the Strauss report out of the ECB filing cabinet, dust it off and go, gee, there's some good ideas in here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but somebody else will try and take credit for it. Yep, of course. Uh, and a reminder, for a full roundup of the week's county championship action, you can listen to Following On County Cricketer every Thursday, available on the Following On podcast feed. Um, you're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, and the former number one bowler in the world, Steve Harmison. Next up, we'll be joined by former England spinner and current Worcestershire Chief Executive Ashley Giles. Oh, I'm delighted to say that we're joined uh, by Worcestershire Chief Executive Ashley Giles, former England spinner, of course, with a lot on his plate, mostly uh, to do with the weather. We'll come on to the flooding at New Road and uh, contingency plans Ash, but uh, must start with uh, the sad news, the passing of, of deadly Derek Underwood, um, still England's leading test match spin bowler, 86 test matches, and uh, just a great, great exponent of the art, um, which uh, you uh, assumed the mantle of uh, for a long period for England. So a very, very sad day. I mean, I know he was a different generation to you, but were you aware of him? Did you, did you look up to him in your early days? Uh, absolutely aware of him. I think it's um, it's a great loss to the to the game. Um, I, I remember sitting with Bob Warmer quite a lot when he was coach with with Warwickshire. He used to talk very fondly of of Derek Underwood, and, and actually, I mean, he was very a very different spinner in any generation, wasn't he? I mean, Bob used to talk about that he almost ran in and bowled really fast cutters, and was a great exponent on those those slightly damp pitches that uncovered wickets that maybe were were back in the day but brilliant performer both both in first class and and test cricket he was um very very different um he bowled like you said um he bowled uh, medium pace at times didn't he but it was his ability to make the best use of uh, conditions and he was a phenom phenomenon right from the start made his debut for kent at the age of 17 took four for 40 against yorkshire and um you have to admire his longevity don't you over 900 games for kent yeah. Played played for them for over a quarter of a century. Yeah, could only dream of that sort of longevity manners. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember he he actually presented me with my um, my South of England Bunbury cap. I think back in the mid eighties somewhere at one of the Esca festivals. Uh, that was the first time I met him. Um, I'm not sure how many times since, but yeah, I think it well it also shows how old we're all getting. Um, <laughs> years are passing too quickly. And Ash, on to obviously onto Worcester. You, you you've gone into their new job, um, and this winter's been slightly challenging, shall we say? Yeah, I've been in the job just over nine months now. Um, it has been really challenging. There's, it's it's almost, and I shouldn't tempt fate. You know, cricket's almost been the easiest part of it. Um, we we're in the process of a change of chair as well going through finding a new chair for the board but the flooding has been the big issue and that's been the well documented issue we've we've flooded now eight eight times eight full floods of the ground which is wow. unprecedented um we're having to move our first two home games away championship games um durham and somerset to kidderminster uh, and all of that as well as the cost of cleaning up does come at a, at a huge price you know and and for a club our size the difference of, you know, a couple of hundred thousand pounds, a lot of money to anyone, but uh, to us, it makes a big difference. Ash, every club has members who've been attending for, you know, 40, 50 years. What do you say to those who, who say, well, Ashley, it's always been like that. You know, we just, uh, we just roll our sleeves up and get on with it. Is it actually, I mean, I, I heard you mentioning climate change um, in a, another interview some, some time ago. Is that, is that a reality? What me mentioning climate change? That, that is, <laughs> isn't it? Um, well, it, look, it, 
I've heard members say that as well. I can understand why they would say it because like anything, there's almost a slow creep of change uh, and, and it goes less notice, but the, the stats actually don't lie. Um, you've probably heard these before as well, but it, since, since 1899, um, of the 30 highest floods recorded here, 19 of them have been in the last 24 years. So wow. it, it's definitely getting worse. Um, we actually, just this morning, were speaking to a guy from the Environment Agency. That picture's not getting any better. Whatever they try and do to mitigate the issue, it's not getting any better. So, yeah, as I've said to the members, for me, um, you know, I have to look at everything. And my, my main role is the sustainability of Worcestershire as a club. Um, so on and off the field. And so, you know, I'd be silly given the amount of flooding and the amount of cost that goes with that, not to look at all options. And one of those options has to be a move away from New Road. And you mentioned well, Kidderminster. Sorry, Sorry Jaime. Um, yeah, just you mentioned uh, Kidderminster as a standby venue for, for the championship games. What about the blast? I mean, that, that uh, presumably you won't uh, derive nearly as much income if you, if you can't play your, your blast games at New Road. Yeah, so at the moment we're planning to get back to, to New Road on the 24th of May for a championship game that starts um, on that day and our first T20 matches against Lancashire here on the 31st of the month. So that is absolutely crucial. Um, with the most recent flood, that looked very much in the balance. We are still hopeful. The sun's out now. You might better just see behind me. Um, but as, as you say, man, as the, the costs go through the roof, they just spiral out of control once you start bringing T20 cricket into it, um, particularly, obviously, your home games and the revenues you'd lose from that. So um, I have to consider it, but you, it's something you really don't want to think about. You say you've been in the job for nine months. How is my old mate getting on? Did you ever, have you come to any conclusions at the, this last sort of three or four weeks when it has literally, the water has been caving in? Have you thought about, oh, I've bitten off more than I can chew here? Or jumping in the river or something like that, yeah. mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, it's, it's, uh, I've, been, I've been watching from afar and thinking, oh, come on, Hash. You know, is it not easier in a tracksuit? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, um, it is a really big challenge. It's a great challenge for me. My first CEO gig, you know, I, yeah. you know I've, I've had pretty much every role in cricket and enjoyed each of them in a, in a very different way. But this is my first CEO job. It is challenging, but I have a really good team around me. Um, it's a great club with a great history. We're, we're a relatively um, lean organisation. We don't have that many staff. That's what shocked me when I first came into the office and I was sort of, you know, is this it? Is this, is this the whole <laughs> team? Um, you know, full-time staff away from the players and coaches were only about 40. So, you know, it, it's not big, but that means you get to see everyone, you know everyone, and, and you have to pull together, particularly at times like this. And we're very lucky that um, we do have people who do pull us through these situations. And um, do you find it easy to wear the one hat? Um, well, I suppose as chief executive, you, you're actually wearing about six hats. But um, on the playing side of things, do you leave it to the, the excellent Alan Richardson pretty much to, to get on with the, the playing side of things? Or do you still don the tracksuit from, from time to time? No tracksuit. I, I actually I actually have at least two hats because I, I'm I'm picking up the director of cricket duties as well. Um, so Richo is head coach. Uh, so so that that particularly with what's been going on the last few weeks is challenging. I'm lucky that as you said, Richo's been excellent. Um, I think what we're finding is well, we work very well together, but I sort of come down from that chief exec position and Richo moves up a bit. So we meet somewhere in the middle on the the responsibilities, but I think we've worked really well on things like um, recruitment over the winter. You know, we had a lot of players leave last year. We've recruited some really good guys and some really good overseas players. Um, so uh, very happy with how that's working out. Yeah, you mentioned you know players had obviously moved on to pastures new in the winter. You brought in Nathan Smith, Jason Holder, um, but just talk to us a little bit about Kasia Fali, who back to back hundreds. Um, mm. What a great story that is. Yeah, amazing story. I can't claim credit for that one. He he was in before me, but 
our first our first graduate from from the South Asian Cricket Academy. Um, he's a great credit to them. Um, and again, going back to Richo, very bold move, really putting him in at three in the county championship. But uh, yeah, what a start for the lad. I mean, he's got incredible um, potential. Last year in the white ball games, he played a couple of innings that were just sparkling. Um, so yeah, we're we're very proud and lucky to have him. We've since signed um, a fast bowler from Saka as well, called Yadvinder Singh. Um, and we, you know, we think that's a really important important resource that we can tap into, as well as obviously giving guys from a South Asian background the opportunity to play, you know, high level of cricket. Ash, um, I know that uh, you, 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 you've got a, a, I think a, a master's degree, I think in, in sports management or business science. Um, but I, I, the people I've spoken to at Worcester, and I've still got some some friends there, have said that the most important thing is that you're obviously qualified for the job, but it's it's you're a cricket man. Um, you've got a feel, a sense, and um, I wouldn't I wouldn't ask you whether there's a an issue with uh, with with cricket administrators not having a sense and a feel and a love and a passion for the game. But do, do you do you get the feeling from from the members in the club that that the fact that you are who you are makes a big difference to them? Uh, look, possibly. I think it has, certainly helps you get a foot in the door um, at, at cricket clubs with this sort of history. Uh, but I hope I'm also, as well as being a cricket man, I'm a people man. I, I, you know, I think the most important part of any organisation and business and it, is, is the people and whether that be our staff or members. Um, most of the time, I think I'm, I'm pretty approachable. And, and, and again, I think people sit at the very core of everything you do and you've, you've got to look after them first. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the, the leadership piece, which I haven't always got right. Absolutely. I don't think everyone does. But, um, you know, I think that's the, the biggest thing I've learned over the last, what is it now, 17 years in management is, is you've got to take care of your people and got to get the right people on the bus first before you do anything else. And put your cricket hat back on. Ash, you've seen in the winter, young Bashir come into the England team, Tom Hartley, um, left arm spin. They've, they've only played one game in each of the, of the, you know, Bashir missed the first game, Hartley's missed this round of county championships. How hard is it to manage this time of the year, getting young spinners in? You know, the, the, you know that's the art that you know so well. Um, managing these guys, where do you see the future of, of, of them who did you know, very, very well in India? Yeah, I think it's really difficult. I mean, I, I reflect back really fondly on on the early part of my career in, in learning my way at Edgebaston, bowling a lot of overs at the other end to someone like Neil Smith, who was my spin twin at Edgebaston, um, through the middle of the summer. Now, you know, I, I think I still think we have a bit of a schedule problem in terms of when we play and how we play Red Bull cricket. Um, and I know there's been a lot spoken about this last, this first couple of weeks of the county championship season around the ball and how the Kookaburra plays. But actually, if you look at some of these matches, if you take some of the weather out, we've had some really good long games of cricket that have brought yeah. spin into the game. Josh Baker at um, Trent Bridge for us has bowled a lot of overs this week, have, as have the two not spinners. Um, so I... I know there'll be moans and groans, but I like some of the intent around this change because if it can't happen naturally, sometimes you've got to force it to get it into the game. And at the moment, you know, the schedule, um, I've said this before, but we, you know, we probably need to, to invent more months rather than anything else because we just don't have enough time to play everything um, with the you know, balancing those demands, and we all get it, you've got to balance the commercial demands with the, the developing players' demands and making sure we've got a test side that competes in the future. Ash, on the subject of uh, Tom Hartley and Shoaib Bashir, and also Rian Ahmed for that matter, um, how, how do you think you would have been uh, being captained in, in a test match by Ben Stokes and uh, his... Um... <laughs> it's a bit different uh, than Asa Hussain. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, look, I think I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I have to say to start, um, before Nas gets offended by Army's <laughs> comment. Um, I, I'm always doing it, so yeah. I think he's getting offended by me. 
I um I enjoyed majority of my captains. You know, I had some really good captains at, at um, Edgebaston, like Dermot Reeve and Tim Munton. Um, but then with England, NASA uh, and Vaughan, obviously very different leaders, but but all the, the, but both offered me a hell of a lot. But I think Stokesy, you know, I think one of the key bits is how he's managed his people and and build that confidence first and try and remove that fear of failure that we know can be so damaging to to teams. So um, it certainly looks like he's trying to get them to thrive. And 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 one of the other things I think so important for young spinners is is to tap to sort of step forward and take control so set your fields be confident about what you want to do and i think i think ben would allow his spinners to do that i think i don't think he'd dominate them he'd want to hear the right answers and he'd want to want to have a proper conversation about the whys but um i think he'd give a spinner enough enough chance to grow and enough time to grow Okay, without confusing me and Tommy um, with with um, too much finance, we have been quite big on the growing divide between the haves and the have-nots, and obviously the hundred is a part of that. And there are, you know, eight teams are currently ho- eight counties are currently hosts, and there's talk of that being increased to ten. And also, uh, it now is inevitable that uh, private investment will will become a a massive massive factor. In the hundred, IPL teams will buy in, and and perhaps even teams from America. Uh, it's quite difficult for the likes of me and Harmy to keep track, but I guess that's your job. So um, <laughs> you've probably got your finger closer to the pulse than we have. Yeah. So, firstly, on the on the divide, the, the divide is definitely getting bigger, and I don't yeah. I don't think you can necessarily are going to stop that. Um, if you just look at the scale of businesses alone. You know, a Surrey or a Warwickshire or a Lancashire compared to us in terms of turnover, well, it's it's just incomparable. Um, so that that is happening. It's happened. So so what's the most important thing going forward for me? It's making sure there is a place for the eighteen and that the eighteen is sustainable. Um, I think currently we there's a danger that the eighteen aren't sustainable with with some of the finances in the game. Um, and whatever you think of the hundred, not you, but whatever people think of the hundred, um, it probably offers us the best opportunity in this next period to bring in the investment we need for the whole game. Uh, and that is twofold. So half of it, well, not half of the money, but you know, half, half of the issue is um, making sure that counties are sustainable and the game is strong and that we've got those 18 satellites around the country that play cricket but also the other half of it is making sure the 100 can compete with the very best of the franchise competitions around the world that means paying the players more probably in mm-hmm. in short terms um which at the moment it 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 doesn't and we're seeing that change that switch we all love test cricket you know we us three particularly are probably real traditionalists we love test cricket but we're seeing that move between or from um sort of bilateral cricket, England v Australia, to franchise cricket. And again, that's coming, that change. So we either need to join the party or accept that it's gonna gonna pass us by. Um, But fundamentally matters, I think it's about, again, going back to what I said at the beginning, it's about protecting the whole game. And and that includes Red Bull cricket and Test cricket. And I think, the, the extra investment into the game or any outside investment that does come will help us do that. And finally, Ash, you know, what's the going forward? You know, the, you know, the, the sun coming out, the water going away and the blast being able to play at New Road, is, is, that, is that what gets you up every morning and, and hope and wish that you can get that you know, great club back on track and people back in at New Road? Yeah, it's, it's a really good challenge for me the priority absolutely is getting cricket back here um the the longer term stuff we absolutely need to think about and and work with um all the stakeholders including the members local council county council um ecb but yeah i think it's been particularly hard because we've had no cricket here yet we've not looked like playing cricket here yet and we're not playing here until the end of may so um yeah i really look forward to to getting back um, getting cricket back on at New Road and being able to worry about those sort of things rather than um, some of the other stuff on my intro at the moment. 
And that was the final one from Harmy. And a final one from me, Ash, is what memories, one one with bat, one with ball, although it doesn't matter, from your playing career? You know, Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum have spoken about making memories, making making memories and, and creating history that will, you know, sustain you and keep put a smile on your face for the rest of your life. I suspect that you might mention 2005 here, but um, <laughs> what, what are the moments of individually with, with bat and ball and bowling Tendulkar around his legs? Anything, anything at all that you like uh, to, to, what puts a smile on your face when you're sweating over the spreadsheets and worrying about New Road? Well, I think, look, I think there's probably, probably three. One's less of a moment, but you, you touched on it, the, the team bit around 2005, you know, um, seeing Harmy here, whenever we see each other, all, our, all us guys, I think there's always something special that bonds that group of people. Um, and, and it was that year, which was such a special year for cricket. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I love playing and working in teams for that reason. Um, the two moments, individual moments, I suppose, Brian Lara at Lords bowled through the gate from a hundredth test wicket. That was a pretty good one. Um, and again, going back to 2005, probably with a bat, not Trent Bridge, as a lot of people expect, but actually batting with Kev on that last day at the Oval, um, being out there three hours with him, with probably the best seat in the house for the one of the best test innings of all time. Um, and, and then walking off and seeing this lot at the top of the stairs and, and <laughs> sharing that special moment and, and a few beers, but really good times. Brilliant times. Ashley Giles, thank you very, very much indeed for your time. Um, very best of luck. Get the wellies on and hopefully we'll have some sunshine and, and some cricket at New Road. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for your time. I know you don't have a lot of it. Thanks, guys. Really enjoyed it. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, and former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And if you have missed any of the show or and, uh, and you want to catch up, you can download the podcast from the Following On feed, uh, available as always via the free TalkSport app or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, what a treat for the third year in a row to have uh, Wisden Almanac editor Lawrence Booth join us to talk about the five cricketers of the year routinely misunderstood, I have to say, by many cricket lovers, in England in particular, who don't understand the criteria. But um, let's, Lawrence, go, let's, well, you, you can you can cover that um, as you go through the five cricketers of the year. Harry Brook, Mark Wood, Ashley Gardner, Usman Khawaja and Mitchell Stark. Quite a lineup. Um, so talk us through it, if you could. Yeah, two uh, Englishmen, three Australians. Um, the criteria you mentioned there uh, routinely confuses everyone. It almost confuses me now. I've had to explain it so many times. But uh, the emphasis is on the previous English summer. And you can't be chosen more than once. I think those are the rules. Um, so, th so the five we ended up with were, you know, it's not always the five who were the best five in the previous summer. We think that's quite boring. You know, that's what the ICC does. That's what all sorts of other awards do. We do the best five of those who are eligible. And they always have a good story to tell. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great Hall of Fame to be part of. Yeah, I mean, you know, Harry Brook, uh, let's, let's start with him. Uh, you know, he passed 50 more times than anyone in the Ashes last summer. It was his first Ashes series. Uh, and he played match-winning hands at Headingley, where England won by three wickets. He, he, he played the crucial hand there on his home ground. And then at the Oval, I think in the Ashes, he got a, a 30, a 40, a 50, a 60, a 70, and an 80. So he was, um, you know, 100, 90 and 100 was all that was missing, really. And then, of course, he scored a 41 ball 100 uh, for the Northern Superchargers in the 100. That was a tournament record. And he, and he batted his way into England's World Cup squad. So um, he, had a, he had a great summer. All that was missing, really, was an Ashes 100. Um, Ashley Gardner, Australian off spinner, took 12 wickets in the, the one-off women's test in the Ashes. Uh, and that was really the performance that secured for Australia's women the retention of the Ashes. The Eng England fought back and, and tied the series on points, but without Gardner's 12 wickets, which were the second best figures in the history of women's test cricket, Australia probably weren't retaining those Ashes. She was a, a central figure. Um, back to the men's Ashes, Usman Khawaja. I mean, he was, uh, I think without him, Australia's men wouldn't have retained the Ashes. You know, that, that double at Edgbaston where he got, what, a... Um, 141 and 65 and without either of those two innings England would probably have won that game and would probably on the balance of what happened later in the series would probably have won the series um 
And Kawaja was the guy they just couldn't get rid of. He faced something like 1,200 balls. He was a top scorer in the series. He was a bit different from Zach Crawley, who sort of scored about the same number of runs and about half as many balls, but he did it his own way. Uh, and he was the wicket that England sort of came to, to prize as the series went on. Um, Mitchell Stark, now he missed the first Ashes test, interestingly, but still finished up as the leading wicket taker in the series of 23. Uh, and he, probably his best performance actually came in defeat at Headingley, where he took five for and made England's life difficult as they chased those 250 on the last day. He, he bowled beautifully throughout. And don't forget the Australian seamers were under serious pressure from England's as as they were going at four, five, six and over at times. But he held his nerve, um, eight wickets at the Oval on a flat pitch. So Stark was Stark was hard to ignore. And then we come to um, Romney's mate, the Ashington Express, whatever you want to call him, Mark Wood. But he, he was a guy who really changed the vibe of the Ashes, didn't he? England were 2-0 down going to Headingley. And he changed the mood just in that opening burst. He got he bowled at 96 miles an hour. He knocked out Kawaja's leg stump. We were just talking about Kawaja, the immovable Australian opener. And, 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 and that, that wicket alone gave England hope that there was a way through this Australian lineup. And he ended up with a five for... He scored the winning runs in that test. 21 needed when he walked out uh, to the middle. England seven down, could have been 3-0. Hit four sixes in about 16 balls in that test, I think. <laughs> and then had it not rained at Manchester, his three for his cheap three for in the second innings might have been a series winning haul. So what did he take? He took 14 wickets at 20 in that series. Um, didn't play much, but what, what he did do was it, it, he sort of had that visceral connection with the crowd, if you like. You know, he's one of those cricketers who connects with spectators as like big hitting batsmen or leg spinners, fast bowlers who can bowl 95, 96 miles an hour make a connection and he and he is uh he was a worthy he's not the final winner because he's just because his name begins with a w he was a worthy one of the five so yeah those are the five yeah it's, it's interesting Lawrence. so because when you look back at the summer it was a great summer both you know england's men and, and women both in ashes series but it wasn't like dominated by you know one or two individuals i can think back to you know my time it was always worn he would He'd be the superstar, and McGraw would be the superstar. Peterson during the Flintoff during the the 2005 Ashes, but it wasn't the summer. So how how difficult was it to come to the conclusion of these five? I know there's few people in the in both sides who couldn't be picked because obviously they'd already you know been chosen as a wisdom cricketer of the year. But how difficult was it because there was nobody really like the standout performance. No, it's a fair point. I mean, you know, talking about Brooke earlier, and he didn't score a he didn't score a Test hundred. Now, usually you'd expect a, a batter who is a Wisdom Cricket of the Year to score maybe two or three. But um, given the criteria and who who we could go with, I mean, Travis Head was in the mix. You know, he scored one hundred and sixty three in the World Test Championship final against India, and and had a couple of innings in the Ashes, but by the end sort of fell away slightly. I mean, he, he actually gets a different Wisdom Award this year, the Wisdom Trophy for the best individual. Test performance, that, that's the, the, the World Test Championship final. But yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. You, you can have years where there are three or four absolute gimmies and other years when there are there are 10 names that you're trying to whittle down to five. I mean, I think I, I don't look at that list and go, I, I regret leaving out X, Y or Z. I, I'm, I'm sort of happy with the list. Um, but yeah, it's I, look, I want debate because I want people to go on Twitter and go, you know, Booth's mad. He's, he's forgotten about this this man or woman. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the easiest selection. I absolutely love the repurposing of the Wisdom Trophy, um, and and I, uh, I mean, I think it works tremendously well, and, and it must be hard work singling out a, a single performance. Um, in your editor's notes, you also mention um, the crucial, perhaps for Matthew Mott and maybe even Josh Butler as coach and captain of the white ball team that England mount a credible defence of their T Twenty title. Yeah, I was in India for the World Cup. Um, saw firsthand how how poor England were. Um, they didn't they didn't simply not play like defending champions. They played like also rans. You know, they like they'd forgotten how to play white ball cricket, uh, and that was a worry because you know for for several years, starting in twenty fifteen under Owen Morgan, they had a template and they stuck to it, and everyone instinctively understood how it worked. Now in India, for reasons that have never properly been explained, they. They went away from that and they spent the entire tournament saying, don't worry, we'll come good in the next game. And it didn't happen. So I think they have credit in the bank because England are the defending T20 champions. They won that in Australia in 2022. But if they flop in similar fashion in the Caribbean 
uh, in June, then I think Butler and Mott will have questions to answer following on so soon from the 50 over debacle. Just for those who aren't aware, um, our listeners and viewers, in fact, uh, the Wisdom Trophy used to be uh, up for grabs for the Test Series between England and the West Indies, and it's now been, as I said, repurposed in a brilliant way. Um, Lawrence, we haven't mentioned um, the leading cricketers in the world, which are two two other separate awards. So if you could fill us in on those. Sure. Yeah, so the leading cricketer in the world, uh, one a man, one a woman. It's for the whole calendar year, and you can be named more than once. Uh, and the leading uh, male player is Pat Cummins, who was, you know, had had a year to to remember. Let, let's be honest, they Australia won the World Test Championship against India. They retained the Ashes. Um, then they went to India and won the 50 over World Cup. And it's over, easy to overlook, actually, that Cummins himself ended up with something like 42 test wickets in the year, which was more than any other seamer in world cricket. So both personally and collectively, he was uh, he, he seemed like quite an obvious choice. Uh, the leading woman cricketer was Nat Siver Brunt, the England all-rounder, who um, she had five ODI innings last year and scored hundreds in three of them. And, and two of those were against Australia back to back. And the other one was a 66 ball hundred against Sri Lanka. So... You know, it's quite hard to look beyond her. She also, she's also sort of embodied the the rise of the women's game. She was signed for three hundred twenty thousand pounds by Mumbai Indians in the the inaugural Women's Premier League, and that was that's quite a watershed moment for uh, for, for women's sport. She that made her the best paid UK team female athlete. Um, so instantly went from uh, you know not being paid very much to being paid an awful lot, and and but but her cricketing feats alone justified the the award. So very pleased to give it to her. And there's many other things obviously come out. Um, Lawrence, you know, Mike really talking about Ben Stokes' captaincy. Stuart Broad, who's on the front cover, obviously there's a bit about his his wonderful career, a game for all, which is a, a brilliant piece. Um, and one that I think a lot of people always talk about is the spirit of cricket, which was we stretched a little bit during last summer, wasn't it? <laughs> Well, it depends on your perspective, Harmy. But yes, um, we asked several people. We asked several people whether they thought the spirit of cricket was still relevant in the modern age, and we got a variety of answers. Um, we tried to go all over the world for it, um, both genders. Harsha Bogle in India was very dismissive of the idea; thinks it's outdated and for romantics. Um, Chris Cowdery, the son of Colin, who pushed for the preamble for the to the laws, he and Ted Dexter got it in there in two thousand. Uh, tried to explain that it, it's not about it's not about what people think it is. It's it's a simply a show of respect, which I, I sort of also take that line in the editor's notes. I think it's been weaponized this argument about the spirit of cricket by both sides of the debate, um, uh, and it, 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 it's simply a request for a show of respect. It isn't saying you can't run someone out at the non-strikers end for backing up too far. Um, it isn't saying you should play the game like you do on the village green. It's it's not it's not saying any of those things. So so those. That piece threw up a variety of, of interesting answers. Heather Knight, actually, we spoke to her and she wondered whether it was wishy-washy. That was the word she used. Should we get rid of the preamble altogether? Is it just confusing people? You know, we got the laws. What's wrong with them? So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a contentious subject and I think it will go on being debated for a while. And, Lawrence, finally for me, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to say that uh, I garnered a uh, comment from uh, several comments um, from Sean Pollock on your behalf and he later, being a man who eschews any kind of controversy, um, said, actually, uh, I'd rather not be quoted. But he said, um, and he won't mind me saying this, I know that, that it was far too heavily weighted in favour of batters. He said, you know, the whole spirit of cricket, he said, you find me a spirit of cricket thing which looks after the bowlers. <laughs> Is that the general gist that you Interesting. have? I mean... I don't know. Well, it's interesting because in the notes I mentioned this. There was an England under nineteen uh, batsman in the World Cup earlier this year in South Africa. I think it's Potchefstroom, a game against Zimbabwe. He defended the ball; it, it <laughs> fell to the ground, stationary in front of him. He picked it up to give back to the wicket, even they appealed for obstructing the field. So that didn't seem very batter friendly to me. Um, uh, but look, bowlers have always have always taken that view, haven't they? It's, it's all it's all against them. Poor old Harmy with his wisdom in the background there. He's, he's never done anything in his career, has he? But, <laughs> no, uh, no, honestly, it is. It's a batter's game. Uh, it is. It's a batter's game. You know, we want the stumps a bit, bit bigger, yeah. but no. Boundaries are getting smaller. Bats are getting bigger. Uh, it's just... Uh, it, but us bowlers, we, we do like a win. But 
I do have, and I am proud of my fellow Ashingtonian, um, who 20 years after me is now going to get, or 19 years after me, he's going to get one of these at some point, which is for you who's watching on YouTube. This is what you get as a cricketer. You get as a wisdom one of five, you get a leather bound, lovely, lovely wisdom almanac. And it's one I, I, I really do cherish, not because of the year it was given to me, but because of what it means in the game of cricket. So I'm very, very pleased for the other four, but especially for Mark Wood, somebody I've, I've seen grow up and seen all the hard work he's had to put in. Van Helm, it's lovely to hear. Lawrence, thank you very much indeed for your time. I know you've got a very, very busy day of media interviews um, lined up, uh, as you always do. Personally, um, from a journalistic perspective, I think it's the biggest job in cricket, um, at, certainly in terms of man hours. <laughs> I, would, I would undoubtedly uh, challenge anybody to say that there's a, there's a longer job in cricket. You still bearing up? It must be. It must be. It must be ten now. You must have done your ten, twelve. Bit, bit of grey hair. It's my thirteenth, actually. Would you believe? Um, oh. But yeah, just about bearing up. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> on another brilliant, brilliant edition. Thanks for your time as well. That was the brilliant one and only Lawrence Booth, editor of the Wisdom Almanac, editor Harmy. We've got uh, only a couple of minutes for. All the other stories that have attracted our attention. And do you know what? Uh, we, I know that I always say there are lots of other podcasts that talk about the IPL. Um, and so that's the main reason we don't talk about uh, the IPL. But we have to mention Sunrisers Hyderabad. Um, two and a half weeks ago, they scored 270-odd and smashed the IPL <laughs> record. And then on Monday, they made 200 and 80, uh, what was it, 287, 287, Travis had 100 off 41 balls. Do you know, it was funny, when they made uh, the 277, um, they've added 10 to it. Uh, a lot of people said, oh, well, we'll never see the like of that again. <laughs> Two and a half weeks later, they've made 287. And people have asked me, said, do you think we'll ever see a team making 300? I said, Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? It'll probably happen every other week in the IPL. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's batsman's game, isn't it? <laughs> batsman's game. That's it. Lawrence Booth just trying to convince us that it's a game, even game between bat and ball. Well, not when somebody's nearly got 300 in a 20 over game. Yeah, 500 is going to be the norm in 50 over games. I love the entertainment factor of it. I've got no problem whatsoever. White ball cricket should be about entertaining. Red ball cricket should be about the toughness of the game. You know, the, you know, two, the, the, the closeness between the bat and ball needs to come, you know, needs to be brought back together um, in test cricket. But in white ball cricket, people want to hit sixes and fours. That's what entertainment's about. So I'm not sure I fancy being a bowler in that situation. But <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, entertaining. 300 is going to become the norm soon. And so is 550 over game. Well, um, on Sunday, uh, the Kolkata Knight Riders beat the Lucknow Super Giants, and Sunil Narayan bowled his four overs, took one for 17, and didn't concede a boundary, uh, which mm. I think, I mean, I just think that in, 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 you know, in a couple of years' time, any bowl, one for 17 on a flat pitch, and I just think that in, in the years to come, maybe not even now, or maybe, maybe even now, any, any bowler that goes for less than 40 in his four overs or her four overs yeah. will, be, uh, will be lauded and, uh, and congratulated on an excellent day. But the main question about that game is that Phil Salt um, made 89 not out, led the Kolkata Knight Riders to a comprehensive victory. Um, he had a bit of luck, actually. He inside edged a couple just past the stumps. But anyway, 89 off 45 balls. So is he now Josh Butler's partner? In, in in the planning and the thinking towards the T20 World Cup? Yeah, I think he is. I think he is Butler's partner. I think he's proved that he's he's the real deal at the top level. Or it's you know, the highest level of domestic cricket. I think he's done it in international cricket as well, out in the Caribbean. Um, I think it's going to be a big summer for Phil Sock because I've got a funny feeling he might keep wicket for England as well in the test matches. I think England fancy him. I think he throws his hat in the ring. If he goes and has a good World T20, 
I think England might look at him and go further down the line on good pitches, especially against India at home and in Australia away. You know, the Ollie Robinson, Jamie Smith, you know, Ben Folks, jo- um, Johnny Besto. I think you can add one more to that list. And I think that name will be Phil Salt. And I think if he has a good World T20, it wouldn't surprise me if, if he's a if he's a left field pick from Stokes, McCollum and Keith, because I know the uh, I know they do fancy him. So, you know, the more runs he gets in the IPL, I think it doesn't just enhance his calls to open the back with Josh Butler. I think if that's the case, England might feel yeah, he might be a uh, left field pick for number seven for England. OK, and finally, um, before the final word, that is, um, MS Dhoni, 42 years old, doesn't play a single game of organised cricket between IPLs. Not one, not a proper game of cricket, just has a few nets. And he walks out in the um, biggest game of the IPL um, against the Mumbai Indians, Chennai Super Kings, Mumbai Indians. There's four balls left. Hardik Pandya, the Mumbai Indians captain's bowling, and he hits the first three of them for six and takes two off the last. He's 20 not out off four balls, which just happens to be the winning margin for the Chennai Super Kings. And the Mumbai Indians crowd at the Wankiti Stadium and Mumbai booing Hardik Pandya, as they have been for a couple of weeks now. I mean, just just extraordinary story, MS Tony. And he's a billionaire too, by the way. Yeah. It's frightening, isn't it? Frightening how much passion he's got for the game to want to come out and showcase and be the big man on the big stage. And Hartek Pandya, just feel for him. Can you imagine Hartek Pandya going, the last thing I need to see now, walking out to bat, <laughs> having been booed by my home supporters for the last few weeks because my team have been terrible, is MS Dhoni with with a licence. <laughs> whap, 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 666. Six, six. If they get, the boos get even louder. So, yeah, you know, if, if it doesn't rain, I know we've had Ashley Giles on this show, and it doesn't rain, it, it pours for, you know, for Hot Deck Pandya. You know, I think the last person he would have liked to have seen was his former captain, MS Dhoni, walking out. Who cares about, you know, organised games of cricket? Who cares about nets? You see the ball, you hit the ball. MS Dhoni certainly did that. Wow. I quite like the idea of uh, picking our own final words. Um, so I don't know whether you've got one or not, but mine goes to real international cricket. And I use that in inverted commas. But, I mean, all international cricket is real. But what really, really matters uh, is international cricket for people who really, really get to play it and get one chance maybe to feature on the big stage. So I want to draw attention to um, the Women's T20 World Cup qualifying tournament, which gets underway in a couple of weeks' time in Abu Dhabi. Scotland, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Uganda, and the United States, and Ireland, Netherlands, the UAE, Vanuatu, and Zimbabwe vying for two places uh, in the Women's T20 World Cup, joining the big guns, Australia, England, India, New Zealand, Pakistan, South Africa, West Indies. And uh, it's just, I, you know, it's going to be full of amateurs. I mean, you know, like, how hard is it to organise cricket in Vanuatu? Um, and, mm. and and these places, um, Uganda, it's incredible. The work and the effort uh, from people who will never, ever be acknowledged uh, for, for the work that they do. And my final word goes to Gabby Lewis from Ireland, um, who is 23, Harmi, and in her 10th year of international cricket. Um, <laughs> just incredible. She made her debut at 14, She's got almost 2,000 runs at 27 and a half with 111 centuries. And, you know, um, I, I, I'm going to be watching that tournament uh, because mm. there's not hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars involved. And I know that for every one uh, of those women involved, it's, it's maybe a once in a lifetime shot to feature on the biggest stage. It's what I say. It's, it's cricket that matters. It is cricket that matters, and it shows that there's there's more than just 10, 10 teams. There's more than just ten nations. You know, you see the men's World T20s now going. You know, we've seen you know plenty of great stories, and we've we've touched on them throughout the show, and we've we brought them with you know coaches of likes of Nepal and, and and places people like that have gone to that. And you look at you know the women's game now is thriving, hundred. You know the way the hundred's gone, and you know we've had Lawrence Booth talking about Nats give a brunt. 
to give somebody a chance to play on the on the big stage and the world stage, especially amateur. Um, it just shows you that the cricket around the world is a game for everybody and a game that we all love. So like in football, when people talk about football, they only think the Premier League, that's it. Football is the Premier League in the Champions League. That's the only football that exists. It's not. You know, so sport, cricket's been hammered over the course of this last three or four weeks. You know, my local clubs had had postponements. There'll be be clubs, countless clubs, for the first three weeks of the season won't be able to get games of cricket, which is heartbreaking because they've waited so long for it. And I'm with you, Manners. You know, this this women's tournament will give somebody a chance to play on the big stage where they never thought they were going to play. And that, for me, is bigger than the IPL. It's bigger than the World T20. It's bigger than the Ashes because it's, you know, it, it's it's real cricket, and it's bigger than money. You've Absolutely. been listening to following on here on Talksport Two with me, Neil Mantle, alongside former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. Uh, and if you have missed any of the show and you want to catch up, you can download the podcast from the following on feed, available as always from the free Talksport app. Uh, we'll be back at the same time next week for another busy show. Uh, But for now, this has been another edition of Following On. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.